So what we've been discussing is the nature and the source of uh, modern growth. And just to remind everyone where we've reached, it turns out that all of the growth of income per capita since the Industrial Revolution has to come from either investment in capital, and we expanded this expression and said, well, there's physical capital and there's also human capital, and each will have their growth rates and each will have a corresponding share in the payments in national income. And then there's this unexplained growth of efficiency in the economy. And then the crucial problem is that these three things are all very highly correlated. And that implies that there really has to be just one source of growth in the modern world. And the strategy of economists, uh, since Solow in 1956 first brought to light this incredible puzzle of the nature of growth, has been to somehow eliminate this residual and explain everything through capital accumulation. And then when we go back to the Industrial Revolution, the key issue will be, well, why did people start accumulating capital only around about 1800, right? Why did we move in that direction? Now, as I say, the first part of this strategy was to include human capital, but that won't do it for you. Even throwing in human capital into these growth exercises, it's still going to be the case since the Industrial Revolution that the major source of growth is this unexplained residual. So then the next idea, and this is an idea that really only uh, was developed strongly about 20 years ago. Uh, the next idea was, well, look, what about externalities? This calculation assumes that capital owners and investors get paid all of the social benefits of their capital. Suppose it's the case that when I invest, I get some direct benefits, but also I confer benefits on lots of other people. And often when someone figures out a new way of doing something, you can engineer your way around that, but just the knowledge that that's possible now makes it clear to people that, hey, we can do this some other way. Okay? And so the idea would be uh, there's a lot of investments that people are making in expanding the production technique, which they're not able to capture. Right? They're not able to capture for a number of reasons. One is that other people can copy them relatively easily. Uh, and you see that, for example, in the uh, film industry. As soon as one type of film is successful, they then follow a whole bunch of other films that try and capture the essence of that. Uh, and you can't copyright that. I mean, you can copyright the original film, but you can't copyright the idea of, well, let's have this type of adventure or that type of pirate movie. Uh, and so uh, there is this um, uh, problem then, and that our property rights system really very imperfectly rewards a lot of investments. Right? And even uh, the, the patent system only gives protection for a limited period. Uh, and so there's very imperfect protection of knowledge. And so the idea would be, well, maybe with all of these externalities, what we have to do is replace this A sub K with another measure here, A star sub K, which measures all of the external benefits that come from investment in capital. And that once we did that correctly, once we did that calculation, then what would happen is that this would explain why there's a correlation between the growth of physical capital and the growth of efficiency. Because countries that have a lot of growth of physical capital would have a correspondingly bigger mismeasurement of the contribution of capital, and that would all show up in the residual, the efficiency term here. And so it would actually explain right, uh, why you would get this correlation. Uh, and so that strategy has appealed to uh, economists and that's quite a lot of supporters. Uh, the problem is that the externality from investment in physical capital would have to be very large. It would have to be in the order of for every one dollar of private investment in physical capital I get, other people are getting an additional one or two dollars of benefits. So there has to be this very large externality that's associated with investment in capital. Now, what makes that hard to believe that really such an externality uh, could exist? Well, the first thing is if you consider what the, the nature of the capital stock is in modern economies. And so we have some measures here for the UK 
1990. And what are the components of the capital stock? So first of all, there's structures. That is 72% of the capital stock. And 54% of the payments, implied payments to owners of capital, right? Some types of capital earn a higher return than others. And so structures tend to earn a relatively low return. So even though they're a very large component of the stock, they're not such a large component of the actual payments uh, to capital owners. Uh, that's the bulk, and it's going to be the bulk in all economies still of the physical capital is still structures. Now, think about Davis. Think about these housing estates on the edge of town. If someone builds another house out there, or if you go to West Sacramento or something like that, you'll see these huge swathes of housing and roads going up. The question is, where's that external benefit coming? <laughs> the housing industry has actually had very little advance in terms of its methods over the, the last few years, or the concrete pouring industry really hasn't changed that much. Uh, where's the spillovers that are actually coming? Most of the spillovers we can think of are often negative ones, that there's more traffic congestion, more air pollution. It's very hard to see why there would be this huge externality associated with the investment in the major form of capital still, which are the structures in the modern economy. Um, a second part of the capital stock are vehicles. 10% in the UK in terms of stock, 12% in terms of returns. Again, where are the huge externalities <laughs> that show up whereby if one person buys a Hummer, <laughs> that somehow increases the productivity of the rest of the economy? We think of that mostly as relatively mature industry with not a huge flow of obvious externalities that are coming from that. I mean, for this to work, it's got to be that if I buy a car, somehow someone else elsewhere in the economy is getting a benefit from that and is getting as much or more benefit that I'm actually getting, right? The way that would actually have to work in practice is it would expand the size of the auto industry. That would expand the supplier base. There would be a big increasing returns to scale. Consequently, you know, you could buy the inputs more cheaply. Uh, that's the kind of thought that people have about these externalities. Uh, but the problem there, uh, what, uh, another problem that immediately arises then is, well, in that case, why didn't GM remain the most efficient car producing company in the world, since it was the biggest car producing company in the world? Uh, how can smaller countries actually enter the car industry uh, when they don't have the benefit of this enormous scale? Uh, how can you know, uh, India now enter the auto industry uh, without these benefits, if these externalities are really so important, and if scale is so important in the production process? Uh, and another problem then is going to arise is with all these externalities is, for example, why did the end at the Mexican border, right? Why is it that investment in California somehow has this huge effect in terms of the productivity of the U.S. economy because of some kind of spillover, but yet just south of the U.S. in Mexico, there's still a huge difference in the efficiency of those economies. It doesn't have that effect there, right? Why is it that our trading partners don't all equally benefit from these externalities from investment in capital? If in the US housing industry we invest and figure out how to produce more efficient structures, why can't that knowledge simply be exported very quickly uh, to other countries and so that they would also get that benefit and so that we wouldn't get this kind of uh, tight relationship between the growth rate of efficiency within any individual economy and the growth rate of the capital stock within that individual economy. You know, and look at Europe, right? These economies are all right next to each other. Why is it that the efficiency growth of Ireland is correlated with the physical investment of capital in Ireland, but not with the, the physical investment in England, <laughs> right? Those are actually really just parts of the same economy. And so you would expect that if these spillovers, right, and these externalities from capital are really going to matter, it would destroy that individual country correlation between the growth rate of the capital stock and the growth rate of efficiency. Because you couldn't contain those spillovers. They'd have to be very peculiar 
if they were going to be contained so narrowly. And so the mystery is, where is all this spillover uh, coming from? What else is in the, the capital stock? There's plant and machinery. Uh, that's 17% of the UK capital stock and 31% of the actual returns on capital. So that's very important. And that's something where, again, we think you could have more significant spillovers. But again, the problem is the most obvious way is that by having more investments in specialized plant and equipment, I'm going to reduce the cost for all other purchasers of that type of equipment. Right? If you're building high-tech machines, the scale there would start to matter very importantly. So every order that someone places, right? so think about airplanes. There's this huge initial production cost for a new airplane. Every order that another company places is going to reduce the average cost of production of these planes quite significantly. And so we'll have a benefit on further investors in the industry. Uh, and so, uh, but again, why would it be confined to one particular economy? Why wouldn't it just show up all over the world, right? A lot of these industries, these plant and equipment industries now are completely international industries. And so for this spillover to show up at the national level, it's got to be that somehow producing using this machinery in the UK or in the US benefits someone else within that economy, right? That either the workers are learning something and then they go to other firms and carry that knowledge with them, or there's this very direct uh, spillover. And the important thing when you look at the structure of this is if, if it really seems there can't be any big spillovers associated with structures, and vehicles doesn't seem very plausible either. Now you're left with a smaller and smaller share of the capital stock. So to, ex to get rid of this residual, correspondingly the spillovers from that other part of the capital stock have to be bigger and bigger. Right? If it's all going to be within the machinery sector of the industry, then it's going to have to be the case that for every dollar that one firm invests in equipment, other people are getting five dollars of benefits that are somehow spilling over from there. And as I say, it's just very hard to, to conceive of exactly how you can get such big benefits. Because a lot of this equipment is just going to be relatively standard, straightforward equipment. I mean, we're talking about earth movers here. You know, we're talking about, uh, well, no, sorry. We're talking about um, fairly standard machines, you know, to do fairly standard stuff in, in various parts of manufacturing. Uh, it's hard to imagine why they would have such dramatic uh, externalities uh, associated with them. Okay? Um, the uh, last part of the capital stock is what are called intangibles, which includes the intellectual property rights that the firm owns. And so that's the part where they invest in developing technique. Uh, that turns out to only in the UK to be about 1% of the total national capital stock and only about 3% of returns in the economy. And that's the part where we think that there would be the most obvious kind of benefits from one person expanding the knowledge stock in terms of uh, other people benefiting. But if it's really going to be located here, which is most plausible, it, because it's such a tiny fraction of the capital stock, now it would say that for every dollar I invest in intangibles in, in production of knowledge, it would have to be that the rest of the economy is getting $50 <laughs> or $100 of benefit, right? It would have to be that our intellectual property rights system is completely messed up, <laughs> that it really is not figuring out what the social benefits are of these types of investments, and that consequently we have a completely dysfunctional <laughs> property rights system in terms of intellectual property rights. And the reason that that's interesting is then it's going to be harder and harder to explain, well, why did we have an industrial revolution, right? Because one explanation that people are going to want to make is, well, we figured out how to reward people for investing in knowledge, right? That's what's driven forward the modern economy. But if we now discover, well, in our economy, we have effectively no mechanism to protect knowledge or very weak mechanisms then it would say, well, why are we growing any faster than people did before 1800? They also had very poor mechanisms to protect knowledge, right? One of the things that comes along is much more effective patent and intellectual property rights systems or what people think of as more effective systems. If it turns out that these things just don't work, 
then how do you explain this transition between no growth and growth? Okay? And then again, with this type of, of knowledge property right, again, you're really going to very, very seriously have this question about, well, again, why is there any correlation between individual national investments in capital and the rate of growth of individual economies or the efficiency of individual economies? Why can't everyone just dip into that pool of knowledge? <laughs> Right? And why can't Canada simply take from the US and Mexico as well? I mean, why can't everyone benefit from this knowledge that's sloshing around? Okay? Uh, and, so, and then another problem you're going to have is most of the capital stock is this stuff. These two things are very highly correlated. This could vary a lot between economies. But now you've also got to explain, well, why is investment in knowledge capital so tightly related to investment in basic things like structures, right? Because you need something like that to explain the correlation then of these two variables. And so, as I say, it's been a very attractive idea to economists, the idea that we would explain all of growth through huge externalities associated with capital. It would have very, very powerful uh, policy implications. But it turns out to be just wildly implausible at the detailed level to try and understand what is actually happening within economies. Right? It's just very hard to figure out why there would be such incredible externalities associated with investment in kind of some kind of very basic uh, intangibles. Because a lot of these intangibles are things like you know, uh, Coca-Cola. You know, it's formula, it's trademarks, it's, you know, it's various syrups, it's delivery systems. <laughs> that, I mean, a lot of it is just about product differentiation. It's, it's not about, you know, it's about persuading consumers to pay more for goods rather than what we think of as kind of pure efficiency advance within the economy. And so as I say, it's just, it's very mysterious. Where is that externality that, that you need to make this thing work? Uh, and, it, and it's so mysterious that it just doesn't seem that that's going to do the trick for us. How else could economists try and get out of this bind in terms of explaining growth? Um, just erase this. The next idea that people have wanted to pursue, again, in line with externalities. And this is an idea uh, that's been associated with uh, uh, another Nobel Prize winner, uh, Lucas, from Chicago, is to say, well, maybe the externality is not found here particularly. The externality is actually occurring here. The externality is not particularly associated with physical capital. The externality is actually associated with education and with human capital. Because one of the things, as I say, we know about growth is that high-income economies have economies with high stocks of human capital. <laughs> low-income economies have low stocks of human capital. And so that correlation is going to work fine right, in terms of explaining growth. If, and then the question would be, well, can we get rid of this residual by thinking about how to attribute this to uh, human capital? And so the idea here would have to be we invest in you $180,000 right, to make you a productive worker. You collect a return on that education through a higher salary. But somehow, your education is benefiting other people in the society. It's driving up wages and returns on capital elsewhere in the society. And somehow, adding an educated worker to the economy has an effect that's greater than they receive in the marketplace. That there's this spillover again. And so one idea about that might be, well, uh, if you add, you know, workers work in teams in factories, right? And you can add a worker to a team who will diminish the productivity of the rest of the team, <laughs> right? And similarly, you can add a worker who will improve the productivity of the people that they work with, right? And maybe by making workers more educated, not only do you help them, but you also help them cooperate with other people. You drive up the productivity of the other people that they're working with. Right? And so that there's this general benefit from education. And this would then, we'll see, one of the ideas will be, could it be that poor countries remain poor because when no one has any education, there isn't that much individual benefit to getting education because there's no one else that you're getting these spillovers from. 
right? And, and you get stuck in this low level equilibrium where no one's educated and there's not that much incentive still to get education. And that's what happened to the world before the Industrial Revolution. And then somehow something changed and we started educating people. People got more educated. And there were all these spillover benefits and the whole economy then just took off, right? And the reason poor countries are stuck is because the individual return to education might not be that high, but the social return could be much greater. And that's why people are not getting the individual signal before the Industrial Revolution, which is invest a lot in education because they're not seeing that there would be actually be this very big social benefit. And then what we see are things like governments stepping in in the 19th century and subsidizing education and paying people, you know, and, and forcing people to go to school. And so it turns out that the takeoff to economic growth then is associated with big changes in government policy where you start requiring people to get education. And so this, as I say, it's pregnant with possibilities, uh, this idea of uh, human capital uh, externalities. Now, uh, one of the simplest ideas then is that, well, if I hire an educated worker as opposed to uneducated, it'll actually benefit the firm as a whole. There's a problem with that though, which is there are externalities which exist, but which you can perfectly reward workers for, right? Uh, not all externalities will be uncompensated externalities. And the problem then with a firm is that if I know running a firm, look, I could hire a guy with a college degree to do this job, or I could hire a guy with high school. And a person with a college degree costs, you know, 10% more or 30% more. But that person will also improve the productivity of all the other workers I have. Then firms would start to compete for people with college degrees. And as long as that premium is just 30%, they only want to hire people with college degrees until they actually drive up the wage premium that's associated with that degree to the point where the worker is actually collecting all of those benefits themselves. Because the externality is capturable now that it, if it's located at the level of the firm. Because the firm can make its decision and say, look, I, I, observe your, I, I observe your individual productivity. I see if you have more education, it doesn't increase that much. But then I can look at the whole firm and I realize, well, hold on, once I've started educating, hiring more educated workers, we're all just somehow mysteriously doing better. And so and firms don't even have to realize that. All that has to happen out in the competitive marketplace is that different firms would have different strategies, right? Different employers have different ideas about who to employ. And what would happen is that employers who start just over-hiring people, you know, people who are over-credentialed for individual positions, will find, hey, we're doing great. We're making a lot of money, even though we're paying these workers a lot. And that gradually the market would get the signal, go for education, right? And uh, an example of this is um, in the cotton textile industry. That was one of the, the, the first great industries of the Industrial Revolution. It became the foundation of Britain's economic success in the 19th century. But quickly, it started spreading from Britain to other parts of the world. And the initial cotton mills were set up in India already as early as 1827. And the industry began on a significant scale by 1850. But wages in India were about one-fifth by then of wages in Britain, right? So India has very low paid labor force. It's also almost entirely uneducated labor force. What happens is that the same, the exact same cotton textile mill technology in India produces an output which is one quarter of as much per worker as it does in England. <laughs> and what actually happens is that the Indian mills end up hiring four times as many workers as the mills in England. <laughs> And the reason England still dominates the industry, even though it has these very high wages, is that the productivity of the workers in England is just much, much higher than the workers in the Indian industry. And it's a mystery to everyone. Why is that the case? Because textiles doesn't explicitly require education. The processes in textile production are all ones that can be done, except for the manager and a couple of sub-managers, you don't require any literacy. You're just standing at this machine and you have very simple instructions, which is, you know, every time this happens, do X, right? A typical textile worker, uh, in, say in spinning, all they do is they walk around the machines every day, all the time, and the, 
you know, they'll look after hundreds and hundreds of spindles, and then at each spindle they just ask, is the thread broken? If so, fix it. <laughs> is the input package out? If so, replace it. <laughs> that's their job, right? And that's what they'll do you know, throughout their life in the textile industry, and you get quite proficient, quite dexterous in doing that, but it's not, these are not tasks that require a lot of concepts or number or anything. And in fact, they did experiments in the US in the 1930s where they asked, what if textile workers were looking after, say, a thousand spindles, what if they try and go backwards and figure out you know, an optimal strategy of doing this? And the answer was, no, thinking doesn't help. <laughs> you could paint a line on the floor with an arrow saying, always walk around in this direction uh, and just look at each spindle and ask the questions, what is it that needs to be done? <laughs> right? And uh, that is the optimal textile worker, right? And so that's a, a huge slice of the cotton industry of people who do that. And so here was an industry that didn't require education, but where educated workers in someone like Britain turned out to be much higher productivity than typically uneducated workers in places like uh, India. And so some people have said, well, look, there's something about education that just makes workers more productive and enables them to cooperate better somehow. If that was the case, Indian textile managers had, could easily add educated workers to the labor force because to check that basic level of education, all you need to ask people to do is sign their name. So they could have actually selected, there were some educated workers in places like Bombay, they could actually have selected those workers. The mills that have done that would then have had much higher productivity They'd have ended up paying somewhat higher wages, but they'd have been more than compensated. Uh, productivity would have increased. Workers would have got the signal out in the market. There's now a big demand for education. And the industry would have taken off. And if the externality then is at that level, the problem is that it's actually capturable in the marketplace. Okay? It's also the case in India that some employers, for religious reasons rather than anything else, uh, decided that they would educate the children of the operatives. So there was a huge mill combine in the south of India in Madras where I th the family there, I think it was the Binnies, uh, actually had uh, feeding for the children of the operatives and also education. And so they ended up with a much more educated labor force. They recruited the children from, you know, their employees from the, the children of their existing operatives. They had low productivity compared to the mills in Bombay, which didn't care about education. <laughs> uh, there's no sign that they could uh, get, uh, you know, get higher productivity by actually adding education to Indian workers at that time. Right? And so the interesting feature then about this human capital externality is if it's occurring at the level of production sites, it can't work as an explanation because it would already have been captured uh, in the marketplace, and we would have seen that already. Um, where would that externality then have to be? It would have to somehow be that I'm in my office in the university here, educated, and one of you is working downtown in a bank, and somehow my education <laughs> is improving the productivity of someone working in some other enterprise, right? that there's some spillover. Now, how could that come? One argument is actually is it's through parents' effects on children, right? Could it be that educated parents, even before children go to school, somehow add very significantly to the children's future productivity, right? Now, this is actually a theory that middle-class Americans have, which is that they must make massive inputs into the education and care and sustenance of their children, right? So m many people in America are torturing themselves because of this view that if they don't do that, uh, the kid will never hold down a job, right? Or will not get to Harvard uh, unless they spend 24 hours a day in the first two years of the kid's life, right? And you've got all these baby Einstein packages and baby Mozart, and, but it's unbelievable. Like, you know, you, you see in a university that all of my colleagues, my younger colleagues, believe in this, right? <laughs> Um, could the externality be operating in that way? Okay, uh, that it's actually coming in the next generation, right? Uh, one problem with that is that if you know anything about inputs into childcare, what you actually observe is the oldest child gets massive amounts more parental inputs than younger children do. 
There's two reasons for that. One is there isn't any competitor child. And the second thing is the parents just get very tired. <laughs> right? And so if that was the case, what we would actually observe within <coughs> families would be very strong effects of family size and also of birth order. Your fortune in life would actually be very strongly determined by your birth order. I know that I have three children, right? And I can tell you that there was just declining and declining and declining inputs, right? So I currently have a, the youngest one. The third one is a 15-year-old. And we pay so little attention to him that uh, someone turned up at the door. You know, we don't have a TV in our house, right? And uh, my wife is an, uh, is an enemy of the, the 21st century. Uh, and uh, so that... Someone turned up to deliver a TV to my son. He had just gone on the web <laughs> and purchased a TV. <laughs> and we said, fine. <laughs> he wheeled it into his room. Uh, and so, well, if he wants a TV, go ahead. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, but you, you actually have the surprising amounts of attention as you get to, to uh, younger children. The, the other thing I say is my, my uh, father was one of 12 children. Uh, and he was number eight or some nine. I can't remember now exactly what the order was. It's just very clear that once you get down that far in the order, there's very little parental input <laughs> into these children. And I think I probably told you this story again, so I'll tell you it again, that I actually talked to my grandmother, who was a crusty old lady, when I was about six, and asked her, do you remember anything about my father as a young boy? And her answer was, no. <laughs> And I don't think she was trying to be mean. <laughs> I think she was being truthful. <laughs> the, the only child she remembered fondly was her oldest son. Uh, and so the interesting thing then would be if that externality is occurring at the level of families, it would actually have, and it's really strong. Remember, again, it's got to be very strong. Because to wipe out this, it's got to be for every dollar of private return from education, there's two or three dollars of social return, right? They're going somewhere else, not to the individual who's being paid, right? So it's got to be that their children somehow are deriving this enormous benefit from having more educated parents. Uh, as I say, the problem there would be <coughs> birth order effects do exist. It is best to be the oldest child in a family, but it's a f margin of a few percent, right? It's a very modest uh, effect. Family size effects do exist as well, but again, they seem to be actually very modest. How can we, now the one problem is how do you measure family size effects? The problem is that you can't just look across the data because people who choose larger families are going to be different than those who choose smaller families. In particular, parents who believe that you should make massive inputs into the education of your children are going to be ones who might be more likely to restrict their family size. They would say, we can only afford to have two children because you know, the baby Einstein program is not going to work if we've got six of them here, right? We won't have sufficient parental inputs into this. Um, so you can't just look across uh, families in that way. But there is actually something that produces nice natural experiment, which is that twins are random. And so if you look at families that had twins compared to, as the last birth, compared to those who didn't have twins, you can actually get this experiment where you've got an extra kid thrown in <laughs> randomly. And then you can say, well, what's the effect in terms of you know, the outcomes there? Because these kids are going to get less parental input. Does that really have a big effect in terms of their subsequent achievement? And I think the answers are it's very modest. right? And uh, the, it, so the interesting thing is we, we actually know families are very important, but it doesn't seem particularly to be the exact amount of input that the parents are making in terms of the, the children. And so the pro I say the problem with this externality is, again, it's very mysterious. <laughs> uh, the other idea about that externality would be, well, maybe it's just something like we have in high-income societies relatively transparent and open political systems and legal systems. Low-income societies are characterized by corruption and non-transparency. And people use their positions in any official capacity in order to often, in these days, not in all of them, but often to enrich themselves, to favor their relatives, to collect payoffs. And so another argument would be that that externality is actually occurring at the civic level. It's allowing the underpinning of the society. It's allowing the free market to operate. 
because people with higher levels of education engage less in this opportunistic type of behavior. And so we do see that the high income side, like Sweden, Germany, these have very low levels of corruption. Uh, and that characteristically poor societies have much higher levels of corruption. And so that would say it's the civic culture that education is actually building, right? And it's not showing up in terms of the individual return you're getting from education, but it's showing up in terms of people's behavior in the political system, right? And that's where everyone is benefiting. Now, I think in this election in California, we had something like, I can't remember what the participation level was, maybe 25%, I don't know what the level was. Uh, but actually, again, it's a little bit mysterious because uh, you know, it, it's not that everyone is going out to vote in these high income societies. And in fact, there's a lot of indifference to the political system. Uh, but we'll come back and, and think about that because that then would say that the source of growth is actually going to lie in somehow producing better political institutions. And that's something we can actually test and look at in terms of the Industrial Revolution and say, well, is that what happened in Britain? <laughs> did you somehow move to a better civic culture and that that was the, the source of growth in the modern period. Okay. I'd say the, the experience of um, looking at industries in poor countries makes it hard to believe that that's actually going to be the key because the problem is that at the individual enterprise level, if you go to a poor country, each individual enterprise is likely to be relatively inefficient compared to high level enterprises in, in you know enterprises in high high level economies and that's something that's going wrong inside the firm and even though these pro countries often have problems with markets corruptions uh, all of the, these other problems there's clearly still a problem inside the production enterprise and so there's clearly something that's going wrong in terms of how people cooperate in terms of production uh, and so that explanation won't really kind of capture why it doesn't work in that uh, kind of local setting, okay? And so as I say, the, the mystery for economists has been that the obvious ways of kind of closing this gap really look uh, very unpromising, okay? And what we actually seem to see is that there is this just increasing efficiency of the economy that's very hard to relate to specific investments that people are making in the economy, either education or capital, that somehow we're just getting better at doing stuff uh, all the time. Now, one other possibility, and this is a little mysterious, is that there is evidence that people are getting more intelligent over time. There is this well-known effect that IQ tests were introduced around about 1910, if we were to take you back and give you the original IQ test that they gave to people there and say, you know, who's in the top 1%, I think now something like 10 or 20% of the population would score in the top 1% of those tests. They have to keep redoing <coughs> IQ tests and making them harder. There's act and this is something that's astonishing to me as uh, you know, a parent, uh, but there's been this kind of steady upwards movement, right? <coughs> Uh, in IQs, and, and, and also it's the case that if you take rich countries compared to poor countries, average IQs are uh, significantly higher, typically in rich countries than in poor countries on standardized tests, right? And so uh, another, i say, possibility is that somehow we're just getting smarter, right? And there's been this general improvement. Now, but where that is coming from and why it would then be correlated with capital investment rates and in economies is going to be uh, something mysterious, right? But, but it could be that the human agent is somehow just better, right? And that people are just better at dealing with everything in modern economies than they were before. One explanation, by the way, has been given for this is extensive playing of video games by people in the modern world because they actually develop a, a whole repertoire of abilities. Uh, and because it's a little mysterious in terms of why is it that, that you know, the average person seems to be smarter than they were 50 years ago, given that it's not clear that the educational system has in any sense improved compared to uh, what it was 50 years ago. And in fact, in fact, I have seen examples of the high school curriculum, even in the 19th century in England, and that would scare you if you had to try and master uh, that curriculum uh, that they had in the past. Uh, but as I say, there, there's another kind of mysterious element to this, which is the steady upward drift of these standardized measures of IQ. Question. Do you think, I mean, I know this has the influence of cultural non-bias 
Right. Um, right. Right. So the question that comes in here is, uh, you know, IQ tests of this problem that they're, they're actually supposed to measure something independent of these people's specific knowledge, but they can be heavily influenced by educational training, and they could also be culturally uh, biased. Uh, and so what we'd say is that that makes it very difficult to use them across countries, uh, but uh, within something like the U.S., we would think that you wouldn't expect any kind of steady upwards drift in this, right? Uh, right. So that so that it makes it very hard. I mean, so these comparisons across country are, are, are not worth anything really. But there is still this this bizarre phenomena that in all countries where they have this time series evidence, as we get richer, <laughs> our IQs are going up, right? And and w what is amazing about that is. Basically, if you think of, you know, th there was a certain stock of people who were super smart, you know, in 1900, that stock has increased tenfold relative to the population or twentyfold uh, now, right? And it gets, and, and so we have a lot of people available, <laughs> right, uh, who clearly are very well equipped compared to this earlier group. And so if, if IQ tests are measuring anything, uh, there has been this mysterious improvement in people uh, as we've gone uh, through, some of that just may be much better nutrition, uh, less exposure to disease as people are growing up, uh, video games, TV. It may be that hours and hours of endlessly watching game shows on TV actually makes people super smart, right? <laughs> it's just very hard because all of these are correlated with this rise in IQ, right? And so if you look at, at it at the, the, the country level, it's just not obvious what actually is, is driving that effect, right? But the problem that economists face is, and why, as I say, this is solving this <coughs> will win you a Nobel Prize, is to figure out why growth is occurring in the way it is and where it's coming from, right? Why it consistently, we think it's an expansion of the knowledge stock, but it doesn't seem traceable to the specific rate of investment within economies. It just seems like people keep having new ideas. They keep producing them. Uh, a lot of them are not being rewarded economically. A lot of them are not from patentable stuff. Uh, but somehow, we, we just get better and better at producing stuff as we go along. And in fact, to, to make the economist's misery even greater, it's quite possible to show that almost all this growth of the observed capital stock is actually just a product of the growth of efficiency. <laughs> that basically, when we look at the raw data, it seems like a quarter is coming from this, maybe you know, a fifth from this, and then the rest from efficiency growth. But once you analyze economies properly, what you realize is that given that there is this independent efficiency growth going on, most of the actual rest of the capital accumulation and of the educational gains in economies are probably quite explicable just as a result of that efficiency advance. So that it's not just that efficiency is, is huge. <laughs> it's, there's a good argument for saying efficiency growth is everything. It's explaining everything about, and it also can explain why you get this tight correlation across economies between efficiency growth and the level of the capital stock in the economy. And, and how does that work? <coughs> well, to see that, think about the following. Let's just do a diagram where we put the capital stock and then we put income per person, right? So this is the capital per person, physical capital, and then this is income per person. And remember, there's always going to be this relationship that goes up like this, where initially as you add capital, output rises very fast, but as you keep adding capital, output rises by smaller and smaller amounts. And so what happens is that the slope of this curve equals the marginal product of capital. So the slope at any initial capital stock is the change in output that comes from adding an additional unit of capital. Okay? And so that's what and so what'll happen in an economy is that how much capital do we want to invest? Well, 
people will keep investing up until the point when the slope of that curve equals the interest rate. Right? And so what will happen is that investment will occur until the real return on capital equals the marginal product of capital. Okay? And that's what's going to determine the initial capital stock in this economy. Okay? Now, let's imagine that there's some shift in the efficiency level that's going on every year in our economy. There's some upward shift in efficiency. So there's some growth in efficiency going on. So what that's doing is that's pushing up that schedule at kind of all levels of potential <coughs> capital stock. Okay? Now, what will then happen is that at this original capital stock now, the slope of this curve has to be steeper than before. Right? If it's just uniformly shifted up by 2%, then the slope of the curve also has to rise by 2%. And so what an efficiency advance will do is it will actually increase the marginal product of capital at the existing level of the capital stock. What will that do? That will then induce capital investment in the economy. Right? How will that ha happen in practice? Um, if you go to a very poor economy, people live in you know, 500 square feet of housing space per family. <laughs> As incomes go up in those economies, then uh, the value of housing space rises for people, and they invest in correspondingly more housing space, right? Similarly with roads, with everything else. It all becomes more productive once incomes start rising in the economy, and correspondingly, there become greater and greater investments, right? And so that's what's happening in the modern US, is we keep increasing the amount of housing space per person, because as the economy becomes more productive, as income gets higher, the marginal product of that capital becomes greater. It's more valuable to people. They want more of it. They're willing to invest more. They're willing to spend more for it. And so what will actually happen then in the economy is that this equation treats these as independent sources of growth. But it turns out that a change in this variable will actually induce changes in this other variable. They're not, that's why they're not independent. <laughs> right? So there's two ways of getting rid of the independence. One is to try and attribute all of it to the growth of the capital stock. But the other thing is to say, well, hold on, the growth of efficiency itself is a source of the growth of the capital stock. Why is it that the US economy has so much more capital per person than India does? It's because the US economy is so much more efficient that our incomes are much, much greater. The, the marginal product of capital is very high in the US economy at the levels that India has. So we keep on investing to the point where the marginal products are actually equal to the return. And it turns out in the international capital market, typically the returns are not systematically higher in poor economies than they are in rich economies. And the main difference then in explaining different levels of investment over time and between countries is simply that uh, we uh, have high level of efficiency in the economy. Now, how powerful would that effect uh, be? That you're going to have to wait for till Friday. Uh, so anyway, so have a look at the uh, handout uh, because it's all explained in the handout. And, and you'll understand it better in class if you go through and actually have a look at the handout on that.